You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Welcome to the Formed and Said podcast, a podcast of the Village Church that gathers in downtown Hamilton, Ohio. My name is Scott. One of the pastors of the village, and with me today is Michael and Matt, also pastors of the village. Good to see you guys. Hi, it's good to be here. Good to see you too, as well. <laughs> good to not see anyone listening to this right now. It's great. Good to see all you out there in the crowd. Uh, so this is our last episode in our series, Blowing Dust Off the Bible, where we've been talking about uh, the Bible, uh, what it is, um, whether we can trust it, uh, where it come from. Uh, how to interact with it, all that fun stuff, and uh, our last episode, we've set aside to do some listener Q&R, so if you've had questions, we've had a few folks send some stuff in for us to talk about, uh, some directly related to some of the things that we have uh, discussed over the last several weeks, but also a couple uh, just about stuff that's in the Bible itself, so we'll get to those in just a minute, but first, we would like to uh, announce the winner of the giveaway. Uh, it is... Michael Pate. Yeah! yeah! Michael Pate, just come on down. Come down where, from your where apartment. Is and where is he? Come next I door. See him. Um, <laughs> if you submitted a question, then you were entered into a giveaway. Uh, we have uh, uh, an ESV Reader's Bible, a CSB Study Bible, a whole bunch of other stuff um, that uh, we've been uh, kicking around, uh, putting together, and pumping up over the last few weeks. And so, uh, Michael, um, thanks uh, for submitting your questions, and thanks to everybody else who did as well. We had all those today so um yeah Pumped scott said that. michael i thought it was me i was no not you excited. Not probably you. No, guaranteed not. to rocket your spiritual life from a five to a ten with all those resources wow, wow that's it. an indictment <laughs> matt don't hold matt, us to that matt matt not, this is not a guarantee we are not contractually obligated matt said that your spiritual life's at a five right now michael. Well, that might be really good <laughs> it might be really good i guess it's all relative He's jesus is at a nine <laughs> <laughs> okay nobody's perfect so <laughs> oh, geez. All right. Wow. So we'll kick off with our first question. <laughs> this is going to be bad. Um, when it comes to uh, validating the Bible um, as definely authoritative, uh, one of the major arguments that um, we use, all of us use, when even talking about, hey, is, is the Bible divinely inspired? Is it God's word? Is the fact that the Bible itself says that it is. It says that it is. Um, you know, um, breathed out by the the Spirit of God or whatever. And so, man, uh, that is in and of itself um, a, uh, it sounds like a logical fallacy called circular reasoning or circular logic where, um, you know, if you're a, if you're a kid and you've ever heard your, your parents say, like, you know, you're asking questions, well, why do we have to do what? Well, because I said so. Like, that's an example of circular <laughs> logic or circular reasoning. Because it's like, well, like, wh- why do I have to? Because I said that you have to do this. That's why you have to. Like, it, it comes back to uh, itself as validation yeah. that it is true or right. Um, so, that said, how do we deal with that? Like, how is that a, uh, is that a good argument? And if so, how so? First, um, man, like, I would be concerned if the Bible didn't say it. Was no, oh, yeah. and so like obviously that's not maybe the greatest test. To say well, this source says it about itself, but at the same time you would hope that it would say it about mm-hmm. itself being true. Second of all, I would be concerned if that was the only test of of authoritation is to say like this says it about itself. But thankfully, the Bible does say that about itself that is authoritative. But also, I think we talked about this maybe two podcasts ago mm-hmm. that there are many other ways to kind of verify the authoritative source and power of it. So we've talked about this a while back, but thousands of manuscripts from the Old and New Testament that verify that this is not just something someone wrote or something that someone pulled out of somewhere, but man, many eyewitnesses have seen this. Um, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit has directed this. There are many, um, like almost journals and, and literal literal narratives, I guess, that people have written down, such as Luke, like we talked about, where they said, hey, I'm going to write down an account. I've seen this. I've traveled with these guys. And so again, I think Man, it does say it that about itself, but there is so much more that fills that out. Yeah, that's good. Uh, first of all, um, how dare you come against my parenting tactics? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. We've all been there. Um, You're a parent. So I think, uh, honestly, while, while we get to consider what the Bible says about itself, 
I would not start, nor would I end there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's basically what Matt's saying. Um, you're you're excited that that says that yeah. about itself, and considering that the span of written literature that is the the Bible, that is a good thing mm-hmm. that it points mm-hmm. back to itself, and there's harmony and, and all those things. That's great. Um, but in an academic setting, uh, if you said, "Hey, why do you trust the Bible?" Well, because the Bible says that it's true. Yeah. You just got you. You no longer have a voice. Yeah. I mean, if if that's your reasoning, yeah. you. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, I I think it's it's helpful and good. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm glad that it says that. If your assumption is that it is divine and you've concluded that, um, then then sure, that's a, that's a great thing. But don't let that be the thing because yeah. then you are subject to any other thing that said it's true. So any politician, or not that there would be um, politicians that are not trustworthy, but what? any other <laughs> human on the planet or any other news source or whatever says, hey, you can believe this because what we say is true. Yeah. Well, then you're, you're going to you're gonna have a bad day, uh, <laughs> m- many of them. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. No, it's good. Going back to my like dad analogy, parent analogy or whatever, like usually, well, if your patience has not yet already been tested <laughs> and worn out, uh, your kids ask you why, you know, hey, time to go to bed. Why? Well, you, like, it, well, because it's eight or eight thirty or nine or whatever. Got to get up early the next morning, whatever. Oh man, why do I have to? Well, because we want you to not be grumpy when you wake up. We want to good spirits, have a good day together to get some rest. Well, but but why? Like, well, we don't want you to get sick and you know mm-hmm. go into all these. Re- At some point, like, <laughs> your patience is exhausted and the only thing you have left to say is. Like literally, you have to go to bed right now because I said so, <laughs> and, and I'm your dad. And that's because uh, parents have authority like over their kids, and so that's not necessarily circular reasoning for a dad or a mom to say because I said so. Like, or or it is, but it's not mm-hmm. wrong, you know. And and so when it comes to circular reasoning, circular logic, um, it is fallacious. It is like a fallacy or wrong or whatever. In many, many instances, unless it's coming back to a final authority. So if you are the final authority and you say, because I said so, then <laughs> then, then what else do you appeal to? You know, like you don't have anything further back or further up to appeal to beyond yourself. So that's where when the scriptures say like that they are divinely inspired, um, it is, it's not a fallacy to to give one of the reasons, at least, for why it is divinely inspired. Well, because it, it, it says so. Because it is uh, the, the the highest authority. And so, obviously, like Matt and Michael both said, like there are lots of other surrounding reasons to believe that uh, that, that the Bible is what it says that it is, and that it is true, and it's, uh, it is what they had back then, and all those things. There's lots of surrounding reasons around that. But at the end of the day, it, it is the authoritative Word of God for that reason. But... Uh, also, because it does say so, that doesn't make it wrong yeah. um, to, to believe the Bible when it says that it is because it says that it is. Because uh, it has nothing else higher to appeal to. Like, yeah. what else do you want to... Who else is going to validate that? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. this is God does this somewhere else in Scripture, and this is just off the top of my head. But literally, God makes a promise, and he says, I promise by myself, because there's nothing yes. greater he could make a promise mm. by. And so, that's kind of the same example exactly. there, yeah. where the Bible is saying this about itself. But like you said, Scott... What else is it going to appeal to? What is right. greater than that to confirm this? Yeah. So. Or like I think about like in that same context, a judge making a ruling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, then you would appeal to, I, I guess, the, the Constitution ultimately would be. The, right. But then beyond that, like, well, that's just what we live out of. It, yeah. it just is the highest authority right. yeah. that we live under. And so so it is. Right. Well, who said that? Well, that's not what's for debate right now. Right. It, we're living <laughs> under that. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. Cool. That was a good question. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thoughtful. Appreciate that. Um, next question. Uh, why are some people um, super serious about different translations of the Bible? Uh, and then there's an example given of um, those who believe that the King James ver- Version isn't just like, it's not their favorite, but it is also like the only one that we ought to use today. So maybe we can hit on maybe the, the first <laughs> part of that first mm-hmm. and then maybe dig into the KJV stuff in a minute. But like why... Why are some people super serious about different... Like, what, why would someone think that you should only use this particular version of the Bible? Uh, so I'm starting graciously <laughs> with benefit of doubt, which yeah, I think yeah. is helpful. And I've been all over the place and I've taken shots, you know, at people like this. And, um, I don't think I've been a person like this uh, in this particular category. But 
if we start with benefit of doubt, then the fear would be that, um, I mean, they're, they're protecting uh, unity and they're protecting uh, the church from mm-hmm. drifting into liberalism, yeah. which is fair, yeah. especially yeah. when you yeah. hear about like, Absolutely. Oh, there's the new, updated, extra new, super <laughs> culturally relevant yeah. NIV. Oh, wow, that sounds great. Mm-hmm. That that should make you fearful. Mm-hmm. Uh, the extended amount of superlatives to, to qualify. Yeah. And so I think people, again, benefit of doubt is, man, we want to protect the authority of God's word. Mm-hmm. That might be why they do that. Um, another reason might be that they uh, adhere to rigid legalism that that they're actually just defending the wrong thing mm. um and i mean i you said we would wait but i can't wait no i, okay. I must say this i now. will not um <clears throat> okay uh when we when we know how if you look at where we've come from mm. even in this series which has been really cool for all of us i think we learned yeah. a ton but but how the bible came to be well then you know, 1611 or 17, what, like that just doesn't add up. It is, it doesn't add up. And it's very, uh, man. Talking I'm, about the King James Version yeah, sure, of the Bible, yeah, yeah. written in 1611. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but I mean, you like you pass churches today mm-hmm. that on their marquee it says like 1611. Right. That's what that means. First of all, that's yeah. not their address. They're like, <laughs> they're like, you know, if you want a traditional church that preaches from the real Bible, the 1611 King James, which someone argue that's not yeah. even what they're preaching from, but, uh, and, and so, like, uh, that is, that is, gosh, uh, sadly uh, American-minded. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I don't think we have to go much further than to say, what if you don't speak English? Right, yeah. Then you're yeah. like, then I'm not sure what you're standing on. Yeah, and to clarify, like, this is a, there is, what you're referring to is a stream of belief. I mean, there's probably lots of names to it. King James-onlyism, mm-hmm. whatever, there, that, that might be a... <laughs> Uh, a not so good name attributed yeah. to. I don't know what they would consider themselves besides maybe just Christian, <laughs> you know, yeah. like the the right ones. But <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, but but it it says that hey, the King James Bible isn't just something to to enjoy, read from, appreciate as another version of the scriptures, but um, that it is the only divinely authoritative version of the scriptures yeah. that you should read. And so when you say like, well, what if you don't speak English? Well, there's not a by definition, you can't have a non-English King James <laughs> version of yep. the Bible. So it is basically saying like that is the standard that we ought to use today of the scriptures and no other translation is okay. Even the New King James or other versions of it like are not okay. Yeah, yeah and I'm yeah. sure when the New King James came out, they were like, I've been, but I've been memorizing, okay, again, <laughs> yeah. benefit of that. I've been memorizing these scriptures for yeah. right. 50 years. And now you come and have a new, no, this ain't flying. Yeah, right. Not in my house. All the kids are, you know, like, okay, I get all that. Yeah. But yeah. your foundation is a little shaky. And I've, yeah. I mean, I've worked with people in the past, um, not at this church, yeah. <laughs> not on staff at this church, but I've worked. And so, like, I've interacted with people that, mm-hmm. you know, that, that hang out there. So, yeah. I don't know. No, yeah. Matt, what do you got? Well, a, a lot of things. Thanks. I echo all that i know like maybe you're asking some of the reasons why i don't know if we're fine with moving to kind of part two of this question yeah, yeah. go for it but when i i looked at some other websites scott has some resources here but i think i think this is throughout that group they believe the modern translations delete verses from the bible um mm-hmm. give some reasons uh, this fraction believes that the kjv itself was divinely inspired not like maybe like the original text that we you know have today but just that specific version um, modern translations promote a works-based mentality, some believe, and the modern translations attack the deity of Christ by removing references to his lordship, deity, whatever. And so, gosh, like, those are concerns, but man, like, I think they're anchored in, if, if they're anchored in that text, then that's just, or that, that KJV version, then that's that's not a resting place for all those things. Like, yeah. I think you can find those anywhere else in the ESV and other places, and that's just, man, that's a shaky argument. Yeah. You have to look at biased if a translator, you know, hey, it's yeah. a new thing, whatever. Like, maybe they're slanting stuff. Yeah. Any translation that's not in the original language is going to have to uh, include some interpretive pieces. It will look a little sure. different. Yeah, which is, you know, that's uh, you're on that's tough, you know. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, even in, in the historical context, we've we've gotten older, mm-hmm. therefore more reliable. Mm-hmm. Uh, text and you know scrolls and all that stuff yeah. since then in archaeological digs mm-hmm. that would make some of those things 
oh, like a little ref- a little more refined, mm-hmm. um, but yet they anchor in and say, you know, it's 1611 or bust or whatever. So. Yeah, so, yeah, the King James Version of the Bible was written based on a version of the Greek New Testament called the Textus Receptus, mm-hmm. which was like made up of anywhere from 8 to 12 other manuscripts that they had at the time in the 1500s. Um, and... Uh, so yeah, that was the best, that was the best they had at the time. It was mm-hmm. like, I think the oldest manuscript was from like the 11th or 12th century. And they only had in between eight and 12 of them. So there wasn't a ton to work with. Um, but that's what the King James version, uh, the, that English translation was based off of. Well, since then, over the course of time, like Michael looked like there's been thousands more, like. I think someone's basically like a thousand times more Mm -hmm. manuscripts, both in Greek and in other languages or whatever, that we have currently today. And uh, some of those manuscripts being a thousand, almost a thousand years earlier Mm -hmm. (laughs) or older, depending on how you look at it. Um, And so, man, there are uh, differences between the Textus Receptus, the the Greek version that the King James writers were using. There's differences between that text and kind of the, the text family that they come from, like from uh, the Byzantine area, all that stuff. And so even when you look at like the King James Version, it doesn't line up with lots of other uh, translations or manuscripts from kind of the same translation because there's so many more now. Uh, and then there's a yeah. whole other branch of uh, manuscripts from Alexandria. Uh, and so and that's kind of where a lot of our modern translations come from that are older uh, and, and more diverse uh, in lots of ways. And so that's kind of the, the transmission family of that. Uh, but uh, what, what you'll hear some folks say to Matt's point is like, well, like, well, well one, I think a, 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 an argument I have some sympathy towards or understand or whatever is like, well, man, like that was, that King James version of the Bible was the English, like that was a, a, an authoritative version of the mm-hmm. Bible for a long time. And so then to say, well, what do you mean, like, suddenly all these people find these old manuscripts, you know, somewhere down the line, and now you're changing stuff, and now you're whatever, like, who are you saying that God didn't use this thing, like, in the meantime, well, this is what we had. And so I totally get that. Um, but there's also, like, at, uh, we have to continually ask ourselves what was actually in the original manuscripts. You know, what did Paul actually write? What did John yeah. actually write? Not did not is this like the, the King James Bible that I've always known? Yeah. Like, that's not the question that we need to ask. It's what did they actually write? And so that's what the all of these new manuscripts that have shown up since then give us a better confidence in knowing is what was actually written there. So there's examples. Uh, 1 John 5 is a really popular one of, like, changes from the KJV to, like, modern translations. So the King James Version says in 1 John 5, um, "...for there are three that bear record in heaven." The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, uh, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And so you kind of hear like the Trinity being, you know, upheld in that particular passage. Well, you come to what we have in the ESV today. uh, And the ESV says, For there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. That's all you have. And so... What if you if you were raised knowing the KJV, um, and then you look at the ESV, you're saying, well, shoot, these guys are they're literally taking out passages of Scripture that affirm the Trinity. Yeah. Like, how is that okay? <laughs> but but that's where you have to say, I, or you could come to the conclusion that like, well, they're attacking attacking doctrine or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, but that's where you have to say, man, is is what did John actually write? You know, like I know it's not the same as what's in my in my King James version, but man, what did John actually write? Mm-hmm. And so if you again trace back, kind of where those things came from, the amount of evidence that we have for either translation, man, it it, it points in a different direction. So yeah, yeah, that's good. I love that. I, I would say as a resource, and I just feel like we talk about Driscoll so much on here. It's crazy, <laughs> but anyway, a book you actually read on the Old and New Testament. Tiny little books. I think you can probably still get them, if not PDF, somewhere. Yeah. They talk about the different translations. I think we hit on this a little bit, but different translations, how we got the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it's just really simple and really, really helpful. Yeah. That's really good. So, yeah, at the end of the day, man, if you love the King James Version, like we're not not taking shots at the King James, like Mm -hmm. love it, you know, go for it, read it uh, if that's yours. 
I think that's one of the reasons people grow uh, an attachment to a version because that they grew up with it or yep. they learn to memorize the scriptures in it or whatever. And that's good. Like mm-hmm. that's a good thing. Um, it's when all of a sudden you take your version and say, "Oh no, yeah, this is yeah. this is the only one that if you're a faithful Christian you can read." Then then all of a sudden you're like, "Man, you're you're stepping into dangerous to misapplying yeah. uh, inspiration yeah. and all that kind of stuff." That's that's where it becomes dangerous. I agree. Yeah, and I think it comes back to how we got the Bible. Right. And then you're not going to hand a King James version of the Bible to someone who speaks a different language. Right. Like, yeah. and then when you get to that point. Then you have to back up a little bit. I mean, you just right, have yeah. to, you mm-hmm. know. So. Yeah, cool. I got another good question. Thanks for that. Uh, third one is: What do we do with uh, contradictions that we find in the Bible? Who wants to? Who wants to take a crack at that one first? I'll let Matt go, and then I'll contradict what he said. <laughs> Sounds good. And then I'll just read the next question. So I'm and Matt and Scott will contract what we what we said. I think, man, off the top, it's important to like. Know how you're looking at contradictions. Are you someone that is, and I'm not saying this about the person who asked this, but in general, are you coming to the Bible just looking for contradictions? There might be a bent there already that is like, this isn't true, and I'm just going to go try to nitpick this apart. There is another side of this where all of us get to say, gosh, like there are some things that seem to be like pushing Mm -hmm. against each other. There are verses that you can go to and say, well, this verse says this. And out of um, a humbleness, we try to understand that that we don't know it all, first of all. Right. We're, we're not God. Second of all, there might be things that we can learn over time that, that do make sense. And so I think that, gosh, we could acknowledge there are some contradictions in the Bible, and we don't have to fear that, as we've also talked about. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we do need to know why there are, how to, tell, how to assess those. And so I think a lot of the contradictions um, that I've been looking at are like examples of some of them are or most of them are, are not theologically like huge. Like they, they don't go against the Trinity or they don't go yeah. against Jesus as God. There are a ton, as we talked about in other podcasts as well, that are like, oh, they're missing a, this word or this word. It doesn't change the right. full text. And at the same time, um, gosh, these contradictions, yeah, I think that's about what I have there. But um, yeah. they're not, they're, a lot of the contradictions that we see today don't change how we actually understand the Bible or God. Right, yeah. Oh, that's that's not. I can't contradict that. Um, I would say the first thing is we get to. I, I mean, you think about where this comes from. It's somebody. Yeah, it, it really does matter. Posture of heart, humility, and all yeah. those things. But um, if someone comes to you and says, "Man, why do you believe what you believe?" There's all these kinds of contradictions. Like, you can. You don't have to say no. There's not. Uh uh Like you get to acknowledge mm-hmm. the the question. Acknowledge the reality. Mm-hmm. You get to lean into those mm-hmm. things, yeah. and you get to understand them. That's what we get to do. Yeah. And we know that we probably get to spend, even in our daily life, more time in Scripture because we get to read our Bible at work mm-hmm. uh, than other people. And and so, and yet we don't have all the answers. And so, like it is just fine to say, "Hmm, I'm not sure." Like if this is where you're coming from, uh, and I, I love one of the things that. Um, uh, R.C. Sproul, I think it was in one of the things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I'd read that before, but so that, you know, someone comes to me and says, how can you believe this to be true with all the contradictions? And and he said, well, man, why don't you why don't you give me a list of 30 of them? We'll come back and we'll start talking about them. And he said, I think he, he said, because at that point, I don't think he could have listed 10. Yeah. <laughs> right, he said, so we come back together a week later and he has 20. And he said, we just start working through them one by one. And like, you look at Genesis accounts and... Mm-hmm. and in the list of contradictions, you know, uh, when was the sun or when was mm-hmm. humanity made? Day one, yeah. day four, whatever it was. And, and the birds came before the plants and the plants. Like you, you have to look at intent in what that is. And so some of them, like you say, it, it's not, um, it, it doesn't erode mm-hmm. the foundation of uh, theological orthodoxy. But you get to say, okay, the intent was God created everything. Uh, yeah. The way that that came about, well, we have to understand the humanity of the written form and how we got the Bible, mm-hmm. that it came through broken people. There are different ways to uh, acknowledge and, and come under that. But I think uh, we get to acknowledge, lean, uh, lean into, understand, and because of that, we don't have to fear those things. But we get to understand the humanity of divine inspiration and acknowledge, yeah, like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. And you can search out for everything, people that have all the answers. 
that's not where I go, but yeah. like, you know, like, yeah, humbly. Mm-hmm. That's how I would say you deal with biblical contradictions. Yeah. Sure. Got one more thing. Yeah, go ahead. Like, I know when I was thinking through the New Testament stuff a little bit, like, there's the four Gospels, mm-hmm. and each of those different authors might look at a scenario in the Bible, and they might highlight different facts about it. Sure. And so, like, in Mark, you might not have this fact, and in Matthew, you might have this mm-hmm. fact. And again, it might look like, well, why is this one? They, they are choosing to highlight something different, or they're choosing to say, this is my focus over here. This is why I'm saying this versus not saying that. And that might not be all the contradictions they're talking about, but I do think that's helpful to know that certain people will say, this this is important because I'm trying to prove this about this thing. Right. And, and other people might say, oh, well, I'm trying to highlight this part about God. And so they might, it's not yeah. they're trying to deceive something. It's just that the story sounds a little different, what the facts are using. <clears throat> yeah. I think that comes down to one of the things we've talked about a lot in the series is just that the Bible itself is not, it wasn't like there's one author, you know, that yeah. wrote the whole thing inspired all by the spirit, but there are many, many different people, witnesses who were, who were trying to witness to mm-hmm. what God has done throughout history in the lives of his people. And so uh, the Gospels are a mm-hmm. perfect example where you have four people who are uh, either witnesses themselves or have interviewed lots of other witnesses yeah. who were like trying to tell the story. And so, man, just like if you have witnesses that witness a crime that occurs, you're going to have different perspectives on mm-hmm. something that everyone saw, you know? And and that doesn't mean that like what they saw was wrong. It just means there's a, a different perspective on what is happening and where they were coming from and all that. So like the fact that they're all collected in one thing called the Bible doesn't mean that like they're all just simply going to recite the same thing over and over and over again if they're talking about the same situation. Mm-hmm. They're bringing their, their <clears throat> diversity of voices and perspective to it. Yeah. Um, to that end, we also have to ask ourselves though, like uh, it's not just, I think we, when we think of contradictions, uh, we have to be humble enough to say they are perceived contradictions because I, I think we would also have, then have to ask ourselves too, like, would these have been contradictions to the original hmm. authors and writers back then? Like, would they have seen, you know, when we talk about history and the genre of history, um, for us, we think about dates and facts and all these things. Like, that's, like, when it came to history then, like, they were just trying to, they are molding a story about characters and people and all that stuff and what God was doing. They're, they're trying to communicate something theological mm-hmm. or something about uh, about the people and the players involved. They weren't necessarily like really, really into getting all the numbers and details right about everything. It was meant to communicate something bigger than that. So even those things, like we just have to ask ourselves, like would they have found those to be contradictions? Because they weren't stupid. Like I think sometimes (laughs) we think that we're just smarter than the (laughs) the authors and writers and everyone who's come before us actually were, Um, you know, that that they wouldn't have seen the same things and asked themselves the same questions. And if those were problems, Mm -hmm. they wouldn't have addressed them. But they're, they're in... Like if you're perceiving a country, they've been left in there. And so it can't, clearly can't be a, a problem for the thousands of years of people who have seen this in the past. Like it, it's not been an issue, you know? Yeah, it's really good. yeah which I think it goes back to the, uh, you know, the spiritual trance. If you think the Bible came from yeah. like, oh, you know, the, mm-hmm. the eyes spinning and like these are the words and oh, what happened? How did I get <laughs> then, then you're going to expect everything to be in the language of God, right. whatever that is. But the, human, the humanity piece reminds me of um, a movie, uh, Vantage Point. Mm-hmm. It's basically uh, yeah. this explosion happens, politician, whatever. And the whole movie is just seven like perspectives, and it rewinds. You mm-hmm. know, it goes through one. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, you have some of the picture. It rewinds. You have the same timeline. It's probably 15 minutes, and then you see it from someone else's vantage. Rewinds, and you yeah. eventually you're seeing it from like the bad guy's perspective. And you see the full picture. That's the synoptic yeah. lens, the synoptic gops- mm-hmm. gospel piece that you're talking about, Matt. Was it one angel or two? Hey, mm-hmm. I went and saw an angel. Yeah. Versus there were two angels. Well, there it is. That's it. Well, no, that's unfair and yeah. irrelevant. Right. You know, like. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, Hopefully that's all that you would ever want to know about contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was going to say, all, all that to say, man, like uh, we've talked about this too, that it is, it's hard work. Like we, we have then the responsibility yeah. to do the hard work of trying to put ourselves in the mindset and understand mm-hmm. uh, the, the original uh, uh, writers or readers or hearers of the word. And so, man, if you perceive there to be some 
contradictions in the scriptures, dude, let's talk about them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think we would love to do what R.C. Sprawl did, you know? Like, mm-hmm. bring us what you see and let's chat about those things because I'm sure there's much for us to learn together as we pursue what seems to not align together. And there's probably something bigger that we can draw from that. So, yeah. I have one question on yeah, that. Yeah, which maybe it sounds dangerous to ask this. But um, how much does faith play into believing that the Bible is God's word? You know, like mm-hmm. we have this mountain of facts that we've talked about. We mm-hmm. talk about contradictions. We talk about circular reasoning, all those things. We, right. we know that there are manuscripts and people, but like yeah. maybe to these people's question, like does is there a spot where at some point you just have to say, there are these things, but I just have to believe? Or is there a way, yeah, what yeah. do you guys think about that? I think of C.S. Lewis, you know, public conversion or whatever and any what do you call himself the most um unlikely convert or not, not <laughs> unlikely yeah. un, like it was it was even a more negative word than that like yeah like kicking and screaming and yet I believe. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah and so he would he was living in academia forever and he would have there's no way he would have believed in yeah. the, the <laughs> story of god and in the resurrection of jesus and yet as he continued to in some ways, debunk and, and whatever. He came to a point where he he said like I can't, I can't not believe this, even yeah. though I don't want to. Yeah. And and then his faith, you know, surely blossomed or whatever. And so I think uh, theologically, I'm pretty sure we're aligned in this that to to even uh, to believe truth, to see truth, it has to be given by the Spirit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You your eyes have to be open, and that's why you have. Uh, which this this creates difficulty mm-hmm. for you who might be struggling to believe. Like, man, you get to uh, dive yeah. in and, and, and be convinced with facts and truth. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it is a it is a work of the Spirit. That's why we see Jesus talking parables. Mm-hmm. He walks away, and they're like, "Hey, Jesus, what are you talking about?" Yeah, and he's like, and he gives them the you know, this is what I was talking about, and he said, "Man, I, I said it like that so they wouldn't believe." Mm-hmm. And you're just like, "What?" It's bonkers. Yeah. You know, and, and so, but but that just yeah. illuminates the work of the Spirit. Yeah. Um, and certainly faith is uh, a huge part of it. And, yeah. and it takes faith to live in light of it, mm-hmm. not just mm-hmm. to believe it, you know. Yeah. So. yeah. It's helpful. We're all living in light of faith in something, you know. Yeah. So if you don't believe the scriptures are true, like you're believing that something is true, whether it's something that you're reading on the news or a politician tells you true. or yeah. a pundit or, you know, just yourself, whatever you make of the world. And so all of that requires some sort of faith because you have to know that you don't know everything there is to know about the world. Mm-hmm. And you have to know that, you know, the, the person on the news or the person on the radio or the person on YouTube or the person, that, like, they don't know everything there is to know about the world. Like, but... Scott, do you know that? I mean, I know that. 100% he keeps saying, true. Notice he keeps saying they. They. <laughs> you. This is a third person pronouns. Uh... But but for real, like there's always you're always placing your faith in something. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You're always placing your faith in some authority that is building out some worldview for you that you that you live within. And I don't know of any other worldview that has been criticized, scrutinized mm-hmm. under the microscope, uh, and yet endured quite as long as as these scriptures in the Christian tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. Uh, and and come out the other side like every time with having withstood the test of time, uh, and so for me like while I, I think that the body of evidence and the faith kind of go hand in hand a bit for me because I'm going to always have questions like as I'm pelted mm-hmm. with stuff or continue reading or whatever, um, and I want to figure that stuff out. I'm at a place in my walk where like those questions no longer thwart me or you know like make me go to and fro <laughs> in the seas. Uh, back and forth again, but there are opportunities for me to say, okay, man, there's probably something more for me to learn in this. And so, um, yeah, so I think faith plays a part in it. And I think that is where the humility comes in as we approach contradictions in the scriptures or contradictions in whatever it is that you happen to think about the world. We get to approach those things humbly um, and ask questions and learn. Cool. Um, Two, the last two questions are, these are the questions that are more, uh, less about like maybe the Bible uh, itself, um, but more about stuff that we find in the Bible, but I think also Mm -hmm. kind of play in and we can uh, connect them in some way to what we've been talking about. Uh, The first is just about heaven. Um, It says heaven, like getting in, what what it will be like, uh, will we know people, all that stuff. So like, yeah, I'll let one of you guys run with it. Man, this is... Final question. This this could be a, a podcast. It probably should be a topic uh, yeah. in and of itself. But yeah, just a quick rundown here. I know from like heaven for me as um, 
I, I think what I'll say is I have a, a more realistic view of it now, and I will never, obviously, I'm not beginning to say I know all about heaven, but I think originally when I was saved, it was like heaven was an escape from punishment, and there was an excitement about what I got to do there. Oh, I could eat all I want, or oh, there's, it's it's happy, or there's no rainy clouds or sickness, and but that was a young me, you know, seven, eight, whatever. I don't know it all now, but but I think what now I'm learning is that the best thing about heaven is that 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 God is there, that that we are with God, and that there is no effects of sin or the curse. And then when you think about that, yeah, like that just is like. Whew, you know, first of all, what does that mean then? If God is there, well, that means that our faith is is, is it's fun, it's done because we see Him face to face. We will have perfect bodies, and we won't have to be separated. We won't have to worry about death. There's no fear. There's perfect love. Um, and I, apart from all the other amazing stuff of who knows if there's streets of gold or if we'll be able to fly, all that stuff is really. I mean, that's great to talk about. But gosh, when we think about, we get to worship the one who has saved us and rescued us and loved us perfectly, that just blows my mind, and that's like the most beautiful thing. Yeah. So, my, again, don't understand it all, but that's the start of it at yeah. least. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have some scribbles I want to try to process. Uh, why are we there? Uh, man, I, I heard a, a video from Piper, and John Piper was mm-hmm. talking about um, the, the end game is to see and enjoy the glory of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And he painted that out to the scriptures or whatever, but just like, but but I know that that gets lost. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like, oh, mm-hmm. oh, okay, what 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 does that mean? Does that mean that we're just uh, in a worship service singing yeah. forever? Like, that's g- good. I, I like worship services, <clears throat> but, um, and so like, I think that's great mm-hmm. that your initial thing was that you get to eat all that you want. Yeah. I love that because that's, that's a little bit further in the perspective than like the the baby playing the harp and like <laughs> yeah. floating in clouds and just yeah. nothing's happening. Yeah. You're just hanging out like, and so um, uh, th- there are a couple thoughts I'll, I'll kind of uh, put together. Um, so yeah, to see and enjoy the glory of Jesus. Um, one writer I read said that it will be better than Eden, and. And so we look at Eden as like, oh, perfect, and, you know, God's ideal and all those things. Um, This was uh, Nancy Guthrie. She said, rather than thinking Eden as as perfect, consider it potential. Yes. Which is is so, you might say, what? Like, hold on, that's, you know. No, but but because the the goal is to fruitful... Fruitfully multiply, multiply, to build, to establish cities, to, you know, Mm -hmm. like all those things, which is just like Hmm. awesome, like... And so it was perfect potential. So heaven will be like realized mm-hmm. perfect Good. potential for the governance of creation and humanity. Mm-hmm. Now that gives me a little bit of a bigger vision for it yeah. than like, so are the streets gold? Because like, yeah. I'm a silver guy. You know, mm-hmm. I, okay. <laughs> uh, I, and so I, I think, again, looking at the context in which, um, you know, John writing in Revelation, the end of 21, yep. if you want to read about it, the details there, some of those. Mm-hmm. Gold and pearls, ah, I'm like, I'm an uh, emerald and silver guy. You know, okay. It's just all the best things. Mm-hmm. Like all the best things that you can imagine. And, and some other stuff I read, like, uh, and, and this sort of answers some of the questions. Um, one of the, the great things, that all the saints will be perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, when you think of your grandpa in, in a weakened state, you know, mm-hmm. just before he passed away, no, no way. Like yeah. when you think of your unborn child uh, that you lost before you ever got to see it, like, no, like mm-hmm. it, it will be e- equality mm-hmm. built around the glory of mm-hmm. God. Now, what does that look like? Are we all 33? You know, okay. okay. <laughs> I have no idea. But, but that is a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah. All saints are friends. This was uh, in another article. Um, meaning, and this is the way that he said it, that if you miss people in the first 10 billion years, you have no less time to find them, to establish mm-hmm. relationships. Yeah. And like, from, so for me, that's just like building out like, that's exciting. That's <laughs> versus like sitting in a gold street or floating in a cloud yeah. with a baby mm-hmm. playing a harp. Um, and then uh, the, the idea of, man, what will it be like? Well, there was work before the fall. 
that excites me because it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can do, do something. You know, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then will there be, uh, I, I think I'll hit on this in this week's sermon, but in Revelation 21, there's no more sea, which is like really confusing. Like, but yet we know there's a river. And so my only conclusion is there's no more salt water, <laughs> which, is, which is the best. <laughs> no burning so eyes. Good. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. Um, no more sand. <laughs> um, but, but really, like, would God allow, uh, and the, again, this one writer, waterfalls and raspberries and all the best, like, w- would he let those things be, like, the glory of his creation now and then just take those things away? Probably not. Probably not, yeah. Like, it would just be even better, yeah. you know, more more satisfying, more full versions of those things. And in the practical, um, humans are, are physical bodies and, and spiritual bodies, and and so we will be physical as much as mm-hmm. spiritual, that's exciting. So you're not just like mm-hmm. some dust cloud floating around for eternity, yeah. you know? Like, So I think for me, the biggest thing is it will be more real than anything I've ever imagined on this earth, mm-hmm. which cuts against where my brain goes when I think of heaven. Yeah. Um, and maybe one last thing. Uh, right now, there is a heaven. Mm-hmm. Today, mm-hmm. you'll be with me in paradise. There's a paradise for those who have... But, but it's temporary, temporary housing. Mm-hmm. Right. In the sense that the new heavens and the new earth will actually come down mm-hmm. yeah. uh, over yeah. this one. Right. And so that's a real thing. Yeah. I think that's even approaching this question. Uh, I always want to tell people that like heaven is not the end. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think that's what what you guys are all describing are very tangible, physical thing. I mean, we used to... Yeah. The previous church I was at sing the song about like my father's house and <laughs> eat lots and lots of food and big big yard where we Play throw football. football. And holy crap! Like that's I can I cringe at myself. Uh, whatever. Sorry. If you sing that song, great. If you like it, great. I cringe at myself. Um, but like that's the that all that tangible stuff like. Not that maybe I'm sure we'll play football. I have no idea. But all those tangible things you talked about, you know, gates made of pearl, yeah. and you know, who knows if that's uh, embellished or whatever. But like all those things are going to be manifested physically when heaven and earth come back together yeah. again, and where God dwells, His realm, where He hangs out, where Jesus is currently sitting, ruling, reigning on the throne. All of those things, like heaven and earth, will mash together and will mm-hmm. be together. Again, like that, that's the, that new creation piece that is, it's the end, but it's also the, it's a new beginning, um, for everything and, and better than what the potential in Eden was. It's, yeah. it's fulfilled potential, but even then there's, there's more stuff I'm sure for us to do when we get there. And so when I talk about heaven, I think most people are usually thinking about the disembodied detached, mm-hmm. just when you die, what happens right after where you at, um, and so I'm mean, usually like, yeah, you don't stay there. <laughs> like, like heaven's not the end, you yeah. know. Uh, heaven gets to, to come back, um, you know, and, and, and mesh with the physical and new bodies and everything else again. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it is uh, an encouragement, though, for uh, – I was literally having a conversation with somebody um, earlier this morning about this and just saying, like, man, it, it is such a popular idea that you just – when you die, you just kind of float up there and that's where you're at. Like how – what a pleasant surprise to find out yeah. <laughs> if you don't know of what's to come that like it gets better even than that. Yeah. You know, what, what could be better than being reunited in, in, with your body in a new body mm-hmm. um, that God has made for you and, and to enjoy everything that was here in a more perfect way. Like that's just pretty bonkers. Yeah. As, oh, I was going to say, as for one of the next questions on there in regards to heaven, like what will be like, will we know people? And mm-hmm. I think the answer to that is yes, from what we can tell from scripture and if you're like skeptical, like we can see examples of like the rich man and Lazarus, how mm-hmm. like, you know, the rich man was in some sort of Hades and Lazarus and they, they got to communicate, talk, obviously, um, even like they recognized Jesus after he rose from the dead. And, and though maybe Mary in the garden didn't recognize him right away, the disciples knew him and saw him. And though he had like a, a renewed spiritual body, they also saw him. And so I think that there's multiple examples of where we still have like our personhood. We still... Like you said, I don't know for 33 or whatever it looks yeah. like, there, there will be perfection there for sure, right. but we'll still have a resemblance of recognizing people. And even the last example is like heaven is a personal place because our names are written in the book of life. And mm-hmm. it, it maybe we'll have a new name, but there is this idea that we can be known. We'll have relationships mm-hmm. and friendships and it'll be like just a great place, like almost like just a hangout. Like it'll be yeah. friends on TV or something like that where it's just <laughs> perfect. Friends. And then what's crazy too is lastly, there will be like heavenly beings there, which also blow my mind as well. Yeah. You know, like it talks about angels and other heavenly beings. And so like Jesus will be there. We'll see him. 
then there will be like these other types of creatures that are that are all worshiping God, which will just blow my mind to see what that looks like, and it's just really cool. It's so, yeah. yeah, Narnia or something. Yeah, I mean, so much. And I, 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 this ties into kind of the way that we read the Bible. Even is like, um, just the the author that the people like in the context of both the Old and the New Testaments, they were not very concerned about what happened after you die. Mm-hmm. Like that is a very mo- modern invention of a question mm-hmm. <laughs> in terms of like. Hey, do you know, like if you were to die today, do you know where you'd be going? Yeah. Like they weren't concerned about that. And so we, we really mm-hmm. don't know very much about that intermediate state, you know, yeah. of uh, besides that you're going to be with Jesus and his presence, you know, to be absent mm-hmm. from the body is to be present with the Lord, mm-hmm. all those things um, into your spirit, you know, I, I or into your hands, I commend my spirit, mm-hmm. all that stuff from both Jesus and Stephen. Um, so there is some, we get to hang out with him in, in a spiritual sense there. But, like, uh, all the things that we've described, the stuff we're reading about in Micah, you know, right now, like, is pointing to, like, this this physical manifestation of a, a renewed earth, a yeah. restored earth. And so that's what we read a lot of. And it's, it's easy for us, I think, to kind of confuse the two and think, oh, that's talking about, you know, just spiritual heaven kind of stuff. And, no, it's going to be that way, like, physically, too. And so, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and to, the, to that one last point point of well we know people i think those are great examples um, biblically th- there was one thing i read that uh, was a, a quote and essentially said shall we be greater fools then than we are now mm-hmm. and like do you know people now yeah yeah right. yeah you do yeah. Uh, well do you think you're going to be like dumber then <laughs> you know <laughs> who are you <laughs> uh hey it's groundhog's day hey no we just met yesterday um, I mean, it's the first corinthians 13 like you know in terms of Hey, we know in part now. Yeah. We see, but like yeah. we'll know so much yeah. better in, in full. Right. Then, you know, yeah. yeah. But you think, no, this is it, and it's going to be diminished. Yeah, it is not going to be diminished. Yeah, it's going to be fulfilled in a way that, well, no eye has seen, nor mm-hmm. right. has any ear heard. You know, I mean, like, when you think about resurrection judgment stuff, I mean, yeah. like you're you're going to know what you did, and, and yeah. you know that's going to involve all the people. In your life. So even in that sense, like yeah, it's yeah. you're you're we don't know 100 percent for sure, but like. Evidence would point to yeah, you, you probably know. Yeah, I'm, like, when you get I'm, there. I'm suddenly excited about all this. Jeez, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly excited about heaven. I wasn't sun. very excited about it before. Heaven sounded like a stunt before. <laughs> Conversation changed everything. <laughs> cool. Uh, last question is uh, this is kind of pointing back to um, our last uh, series through Exodus, and this is uh, I mean it's it it's uh, it's a good question. Like, why didn't God just kill Pharaoh like straight up at the very beginning of all this stuff in Exodus, when God's people were enslaved and all that, why did He choose to use Aaron and Moses? You know, obviously slowly, like very inefficient, incompetent, mm-hmm. <laughs> unwilling sometimes participant. Why did He choose to use them uh, instead of just you know taking Pharaoh out? Himself? I love the order of questions. That's so, good. What, what, yeah. a, what a big one to go out. Of. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love it. Heaven. Oh, the greatest thing. Why did God kill Pharaoh? <laughs> You're welcome. I like it. No, go ahead. Oh, well, I just thought first of all, like. That this is probably, I won't speak for anyone else, but how I would see Pharaoh in my flesh. Hmm. This is the easy way to do it. He's the bad guy. He's the problem. Bam. Just And then we're done. Yeah. Fortunately for us and for Pharaoh, God is patient. He's merciful. He has bigger plans. He knows how to use the situation, even redeem what is broken for good. And I think that's what he does here. He, he could. He had the power to just take Pharaoh out. Um, but in God's grace, I think through this, he chooses, and we said this in, in the message series, but he chooses to show us and the people of Israel and Egypt, it says, that, that he is the one true God through all of the plagues, through bringing finally his people out, and that he is miraculous and powerful and, and better than any of the other gods. And I think he chose to do it this way mm-hmm. to, to, as Michael said earlier, to like just reveal his glory, his power, who he is, and, and I think those Israelites there, their faith grew because of that, and certainly ours can grow today from seeing all of that. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think he he tells us repeatedly that his name might be made known, mm-hmm. that his name might be glorified, and and he says it in, in two explicit ways that that all those in the land mm-hmm. of Egypt might know that I am God. Yeah, and so I th- I think we said in the series like you have to imagine a context that is. You know, everything is pluralism and everything is, you know, polytheism and um, believing in in many, 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 many gods. You know, mm-hmm. in Egypt, a uh, hundred plus gods or, or goddesses. Um, and he's cutting the grain, c- cutting against the grain and saying, nope, 
Mm-hmm. I am the Lord. I, I am one. There, there are no other. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's setting up. Yeah, he, he talks about that in Ten Commandments and, and on and on. But, like, he had to make a deal. Mm-hmm. He had to make a big deal of it because yeah. otherwise it would just be one. And if, if there were no dialogue and, and, and we never mm-hmm. saw how God, uh, I mean, I guess in the biggest mm-hmm. scheme, how he rescued his people from physical captivity makes our spiritual slavery and spiritual um, rescue all the more visible for us today. Mm -hmm. So I think one element is he had us in mind Mm -hmm. um, and those after Christ. And so he's painting out a picture that would, you know, be analogous to our spiritual freedom, but, but really like, gosh, so that his name might be known. Um, And and then the implication, especially the Aaron and Moses piece, I love that. that That's part of the question that that God uses people to make His name known, mm-hmm. yeah, and that was true then, and it's true today, and and it's not snap your fingers and mm-hmm. everything goes away and everything's better because this life is tough, but um, but yeah, I, mean, I think He's He's just demonstrating for whatever reason, and some of it is eh, I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, He He did He does what He does because um, that's what He does, but but I think a lot of those reasons play into that. So yeah, man, yeah, the the question, the first question could. You could ask the same of Adam and Eve. Like, why didn't God just kill Adam and Eve? You know, like because they they rebelled against Him. Mm-hmm. You know, just like Pharaoh did. Um, and to Matt, your point, <laughs> thank goodness that He didn't do that. You know, because that wouldn't bode well for any of us. Um, yeah, I mean, God is certainly effective. He has redemptive, restorative purposes. Mm-hmm. He's a God who's certainly just, but then also finds a way to be the justifier of us as well um, by by His own sacrifice of. Christ on the cross um, for our sins, and so like he, he is effective in reaching his redemptive ends, but uh, by no means is he efficient. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He yeah. take he takes a long time, <laughs> and and it really is all about one uh, getting glory right mm-hmm. over his enemies, so that uh, people might know that he's God. Um, maybe think of Second uh, Peter. Three, uh, certain in verse eight, he says, uh, "Don't look, don't overlook this fact, uh, this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance." Hmm. I mean, that's that is the heart of God is that He hasn't swooped in and just said, "Okay, things are yeah. done." And we don't know all the reasons why he hasn't done that even yet today. Yeah. But one of the reasons that we know because of this very passage is that he is wanting more and more people to come to repentance. He's mm-hmm. being patient with us. And so, um, and he's effective to that end. And he does get to use us. We are his means by which he wants to accomplish that and call people to repentance and belief. That's why he used Aaron and Moses. Yeah. That's why he uses us, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. all of us in his church to to do those things. And so that is, that's encouraging. That's, that's the story throughout the scriptures. That's true. Yeah. It certainly wasn't the easiest route, even just to use Aaron and Moses. Like yeah. I was still struggle for God to a God met him along the road and attempted to even kill Moses at one point. <laughs> and so it wasn't like that was like the most efficient route to go. Like to your point, yeah. Scott, it was like, but he had this in mind all along to show us certain things. Yeah. And it's the sanctifying process for Moses and Aaron as well. They got to see yeah. God and they got their faith tested and they got to put trust in things. And so, yeah, God has many reasons for extending yeah. that out for us. For sure. Speaking of efficiency, and the, the road out wasn't very efficient either. <laughs> <laughs> it took him 40 years. That is true. Navigate to, ah, oh, it took me to the wrong place. <laughs> That's good. All right, cool. Well, uh, that wraps up this episode. That wraps up the series. Um, we are going to, or uh, kind of balancing a couple of things. We're we're trying to work through also some Village Gate stuff. Um, so we recorded one podcast we put out a few weeks ago on uh, the gospel component of the Village Gate. We're going to work on doing that for uh, community and mission as well, for membership stuff, and just for people to know who we are as a, another way of digesting some of that content and to hear us interact around some of that as well. Um, and we're also gonna take a look at um, just justice um, and and uh, racial stuff and, mm-hmm. and all sorts of things here in the coming weeks as well. Um, we want to, uh, man, we, we want to have some space to flush those things out and talk about those things, to declare some things, mm-hmm. and also to just kind of put out our posture of heart and how we're thinking about all that stuff and, and how we're calling the church uh, to live in light of those things. So um, yeah, some big stuff, but that's kind of what to expect from us over the coming weeks. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your questions again. Congratulations, Michael, for your win. We'll get those to you soon, uh, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>